I'd like to welcome all of you here tonight. I think this is an exciting night. Um, I have the fun job of introducing the... Uh... Okay, I want to see. Nobody speaks, so... <laughs> I don't... For me, scientifically and clinically, there is no reason to prescribe something with a heel lift, with stiffness, and with cushioning, for someone that start a running program, and this person need to be gradual in big bulky shoes or in flat shoes in the both case. And I'm not sure if someone start with the two kind of shoes, if we can really see a difference for the maybe the first years of practice. Because the, most of the injury incidents come from a lot more too much too soon, a lot uh, before the shoes. And, uh, but why to start to run with issues that we know that will change your biomechanics, slow down your cadence, uh, change the stress uh, on your knee, and uh, protect some part of your foot that in a long term process will become weaker? Weaver. <laughs> Last year we studied 109 women that wanted to run their first half marathon. We measured them biomechanically, we measured their flexibility, and uh, identified their specific category of uh, their foot type, and then we took the best motion control shoe that we could get, the best neutral shoe, and the best cushion shoe. We had those individuals run for 13 weeks on a graduated you know, program and at the end of the day the neutral shoe uh, gave the, you know, the less injuries. The shoe that gave the most injuries was the motion control shoe. Even for those that we had biomechanically ass you know, assessed that they were significant, you know, pro -raters. So obviously the pendulum had swung to, to such a degree that that t uh, type of shoe was certainly, uh, you know, too, uh, too stiff. But what we need to do now to answer that question is to, now that we've looked at minimalistic shoes, is to take the minimalistic shoe and then compare that to the shoe that we'd identified created the less injury uh, out of this uh, population that we're supposed to have the highest risk injury in terms of female running runner that was now upping their mileage where they had successfully run a 10k you know to uh, you know to a half marathon. But for all of us, the uh, Peter Butler's in the room uh, and people that are my age that uh, I've run 120,000 miles, I've run over 60 marathons, and when I started, we all ran in minimalistic shoes because that's all that existed. We all ran pre-Nike, all in uh, tire shoes, and uh, the early New Balance shoes. They had no heel lift, they had no shock absorption, they had no arch support. Did we get injured? You better believe it. Who survived? that those that were lucky enough uh, that could tolerate the training that we were doing, which was classically 100 miles a week, and it came down to the survival you know, of the fittest. But you did adapt, and you had to do it, and who did it was, as you were saying, who did it slowly and gradually built it up. But we all, at the end, were still running volumes and volumes of running, you know, in those, uh, uh, in those shoes. Uh, uh, but we were, a, 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 you know, a small group of the population. Then the population grew. And so from there, I think for those individuals, when they start off, they've got to start off slow. They are all, uh, uh, as Adam said, they, a, good, a good number of them are tight in their gas rock and soleus. Uh, uh, a good majority of them do not know how to run 
up on their forefoot. They're not strong enough, don't have enough dynamic strength to run on their forefoot. Uh, uh, and uh, that uh, the individuals that I see that are getting injured in minimalistic shoes are individuals that start off, you know, too quickly and are tight. Um, I just want to add to that too, that uh, it comes down again to me, uh, understanding the athletes and the runners and the psychology and the training programs. And people that are used to running in, in these traditional type shoes and, and then saying, well, let's get into a middle of the shoe. A lot of them want to continue to do their 40, 50, 60, 70 plus mile weeks. And if you're running the kinds of times that Dr. John was in this day, well, you're going to probably have to put in those types of miles. Okay, but for the average four and a half hour marathoner, again, I, I, it comes back to I don't think you need to do an excessive volume. And you can't expect to do the same volume initially, at least, in those, those smaller heel and more uh, zero drop shoes that, that, that you're doing in these shoes uh, right now. So you've got to understand that a lot of runners are very, very, very reluctant to cut back on their running. And that's, to me, as a coach, is one of the toughest things, uh, getting people to buy into a program where you're going to have to run less, you're going to have to learn to change your running style, and slowly adapt. And that's one of the key things, I think. So when you say, what kind of shoot do you recommend? But you also under understand who are you dealing with, what's the psychology with them, and how can you get them to buy into the training program to let, them, to let those adaptations take place? Um. I'll take a bit of a cop-out answer and say that it depends. Uh, and it depends, I think, uh, as much as anything else on commitment and discipline of the, of the runner. To, to learn to do and move and, and have the strength required to, to run in this manner, as we've all sort of discussed here tonight, takes uh, a lot of discipline, a lot of commitment. Blaze mentioned one minute additional per training session. Um, and a lot of people, especially if we're dealing with someone who's the more recreational athlete, maybe they have family, maybe they have children, maybe they've got a very busy job, just want to go home and run. And I think at the end of the day, we uh, as people and we as clinicians or therapists or trainers or coaches have to recognize that we can't put everyone into this cookie cutter position of minimalist or traditional for that matter. So you have to have a really good uh, hard think for yourself or as a clinician um, with the person about what their goals are. And just putting them into the flattest shoe possible isn't necessarily the answer. The, the wonderful thing now is that there are lots and lots of shoes available to us. Six months ago, that wasn't the case. Six months before that, it was really limited. So we can actually really tailor that, that fitting process to the person a little bit more specifically without having to think about the old categories of um, the, the neutral stability motion control. So I think we have to take the, the person into account when we're looking at that shoe, um, figure out what's the most minimal shoe they can wear, and make sure that they go into that shoe so they can learn all these positive uh, form effects and strength effects and mobility effects that we're talking about. All right, let's... Uh, what is the role of footwear in the prevention of running in groups? Okay, just for the last question. <laughs> <laughs> Because I think we answered this question with all, because the question was, what do you, do you recommend for the beginner? And that's my, uh, for me, the recommendation for the beginner is not the same that the recommendation for someone used to run in big bulky shoes and want to change. That's not the same thing. You want to start a running program, don't think you will be protected and you will be less injured with that, 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 or that. You start a running program, seriously, I'm pretty sure there is no difference. And it's interesting, we started a study, uh, I thought that we will the first one, but now that I know the Jack, I know that we will the second one, or maybe the third one, because there is another study in Boston and another one in South Africa comparing minimal shoes versus uh, traditional shoes. And uh, I'm pretty sure we won't see a big difference between all those kind of shoes if you start a running program with that. And you've got to start slowly. <laughs> <laughs> so from uh, preventing injuries, we definitely believe um, in natural football pattern. I mean, we talked about you know, heel striking, hip foot striking, forefoot foot striking. And um, you know, we actually believe that whatever your body naturally does is OK. Um, you know, 78% of people are natural heel strikers, and that's not necessarily a bad thing. 
um, overstriding is a bad thing, but being in a shoe that allows you to run in a natural way that um, your body naturally adopts and, and likes and, and is happy with is, is a good way that you're going to be able to prevent injuries um, versus necessarily trying to change your football pattern, just being able to get a shoe that's going to um, accommodate that. And so that's what we really believe is um, getting a shoe that's going to work with your natural motion, with your, per your body's preferred motion path, aligning your joints and uh, aligning your body is really what's going to keep you healthier and uh, reducing those, you know, force factors and whatnot through your through your body and uh, reducing stress. So that's where we are. Minimally shoes since 10 years. But 10 years ago, there is no minimalist shoes and the word minimalism doesn't exist. So I was prescribing racing flat shoes. My goal was to be close to the uh, natural biomechanics and uh, promote adaptation of the tissue. I didn't understand at that time, 10 years ago, why we want to absolutely protect the foot and not the other part of the body. So I was just say, okay, the nature, uh, we are uh, born with no heel lift under the heel, and uh, we have a certain amount of flexibility, so I want to just be sure that the shoes don't enter for too much with that. So when we speak about minimal issues, I fully agree with, um, and, uh, <laughs> and uh, there is 100 step between the Oka, the bees, <laughs> the Oka, the bees, and after that the five finger. There is 100 step, and I think that people, if people want to move to more minimally shoes, they, it's not necessary to start absolutely to run in five fingers. There is a lot of uh, in between. But again, I don't understand why we do the promotion of this kind of shoes. Because that doesn't create an injury. And I think that that can be harmful for the patient. So uh, when I prescribe racing flat shoes I, or minimal shoes, I look for flexibility, weight, uh, high heel lift, interference, the height of the shoes in general, and uh, fitting and there is different categories and I move progressively to something more natural. And I think one thing I'd like to see, in the, if, if this is possible, sent out for the shoe manufacturers is um, ways to uh, have more sizing, so not just length, but uh, width. Um, mm -hmm. I think that's, that's an issue for a lot of people. Um, and then also having a way, and I don't know if this is totally possible or not, but where people can individualize and customize the shoes, and I'm not talking just about colors, but if the, the fit of the of the upper, um, if somebody's got a wider, more kind of beefier type foot, can can that can they get that model? But can they can they expand that? And if they have a narrow one, can they can they narrow it more? So, just ways that they can um, customize it so the foot the, the shoe is really almost made to their own foot. If that's a possibility, I don't know if that's possible for a, a general production patient. Kind of Reebok shoe. pump. <laughs> Let's bring it back. <laughs> hey Jim, certainly, and if you want to categorize them as the traditional shoe, uh, we're certainly seeing, and uh, it's obviously appropriate, certainly from the research that we and others have you know, done now, when you randomize uh, shoes amongst individuals, uh, their own specific foot type is a reduction in the, the degree of you know, motion control. Uh, the, some motion control, for some, certain individuals it's required, but uh, that we've seen, as I mentioned, the pendulum has uh, you know, obviously gone too far. So we'll see, uh, I think, over the next uh, you know, seasons coming out, there will be less and less uh, you know, of the motion control features uh, you know, in shoes. And so that we'll be getting down to more of uh, the uh, natural uh, line, as you're talking about, more of the stability uh, 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 neutral shoe uh, that individuals over time, uh, the majority of them uh, can adapt as long as they uh, uh, are not too heavy, as long as they do work on their strength. And, and the strength uh, really has to involve their, their core strength and their hip abduction uh, power. Uh, uh, and, and not just in terms of uh, the, the strength of uh, you know of the lower extremity. 
Yeah, I think that's, this is actually a really good question as far as, you know, how do you reduce injuries with running shoes? And I mean, people have talked about studies, like in the last 30, 40 years, shoes have changed a lot, but the injury occurrence rate among runners really hasn't gone down or decreased. And um, that's something that we actually talk about a lot and take seriously. And there's different ways to look at it, you know, and there's, because the shoes, the way they've evolved, you know, shoe like the bees that's really big and, and supportive, maybe there's people running today that wouldn't have been able to run 30 years ago. Uh, but also along those lines, um, we really want to answer that question. We've uh, partnered with a couple of researchers. One is Joe Hamill, University of Massachusetts. Another one is Peter Brueggemann at the Sports University in Cologne. And we're uh, in year two of a five-year prospective study of you know how do people um, you know how do people get injured and then how do we build shoes to help reduce the injury occurrence rate. And so um, really up to now, there's really the amount of uh, research out there prospective studies is actually is really lacking as far as this goes. And so that's something that we really want to tackle and really have some really good solid answers for so we can actually start uh, you know making our shoes even better and see that when we do put on a shoe that um, you know depending on what your parameters are, your mechanics and everything, that it'll uh, you know help reduce the risk of you getting injury and maybe taking